Hello everybody and welcome to another uh, tutorial. Uh, I'm your host Rob Hirschfeld and today we're talking about the Edge Lab. Uh, Edge Lab is a special project that we've been working on that basically creates a self-contained Raspberry Pi cluster. It could be any hardware but we're focused on Pis because they're especially inexpensive and, pro and uh, popular. So uh, what we want to be able to do is be able to assemble Pies into a cluster that could build pretty much anything. We focused on K3S, lightweight Kubernetes, as a starting place. The goal here is to be completely automated. So basically you burn some SD cards, you walk away, um, and that's what I'm gonna walk you through to show you how to set this up. And then once it's set up, uh, you can just reset the machines and, and take another pass at it. It takes just a couple of seconds. Um, so really brings cutting edge infrastructure as code, zero touch automation into a desktop environment for under $500. Uh, really game changing. So we hope you're going to follow along here. What I've got is the Edge Lab site. So this is in Digital Rebar Edge Lab. And uh, it's an open source reference architecture that we've been building up. Uh, very simple network design for Raspberry Pis. We're going to walk you through all, all of what this is, um, one of them becomes a digital rebar server and then controls DHCB, Pixie, infrastructures, code automation, internet gateway, it provides all of the functionality. It's your persistent node. And then we're free to in memory boot and immutably deploy things on all these other Raspberry Pis. And when we're ready to reset the environment, we just unplug them and they get wiped effectively because they're running in memory and they reset. That means we do require uh, RPi 4B with four gigs of RAM. So it's the high end, if you will, uh, Raspberry Pi from that perspective. Um, and there's a whole bunch of information on this site. And what I would suggest you do is check out the bill of materials. Uh, we've documented what those are with some different costs. Um, we're starting to play with a power over ethernet alternative that's a little bit more expensive, but very easy to manage. Uh, the, what I'm gonna demo for you today is the Cloudlet case. Uh, which can hold up to eight Raspberry Pis. It's also a very nice thing, but it, you have to manage the power. Uh, there's a little bit more, wire, little bit more cabling uh, required from that perspective. And then, so I've already done that. We have some documentation that describes uh, how you build those things up. Uh, if you like pictures, I have a, a picture version. So I'm gonna show you what I did. This is basically what I've already walked through and you're not gonna see in the video, but this is the Pis wiring them together, strongly recommend labeling the wires, uh, inserting the SD cards. I'm gonna show you how we do that, uh, at least how we burn them. Wiring together our, our server node, and then we power it on. So this, the purpose of this video is to really walk you through the bootstrapping process, which is what we have documented here. Uh, this assumes that you've already started with uh, the uh, USB system. So, what, what we include here are links to uh, Raspberry Pi images that you burn. You'll need uh, at least two. We'd recommend four SD cards. And then you're going to use a tool like uh, this Belena Etcher to take one of these images, select the target. In this case, I have to take my USB stick with, uh, I haven't installed my, my USB, it's very small, SD card in there. And then I will put that in. In this case, I've already done it, so you don't have to watch me do this. This process, especially for the larger image, can take five minutes. Once it's done, you don't have to do it again. Notice we've identified that. We can continue, and then I could flash this card, um, and it would take a couple minutes to write the image. You need to do that for both one for the server and then uh, one for every client that you want. You don't have to have one for the client. The client is actually op it, the client's required for the initial boot sequence, but once you've flashed the BIOS to Pixie Boot, which is what the client sets it to do, uh, it no longer uses that SD card for anything in the, boot, in the boot process. So you can remove those SD cards, or if you only have two SD cards, you can leave one in the server. That one has to stay because it's a persistent image. And then you can basically uh, boot the clients in order. Uh, that first initial boot provision process takes uh, about five or 10 minutes. I've already done it on this system, so we're not gonna have to wait for that. Um, and so with that, that's enough talking. Let's uh, pause for a second, rearrange the cameras, and I will show you uh, what this process looks like uh, from the screen perspective. So I've shifted camera angles here to show you the Raspberry Pi cluster. There's my hand. 
Um, right now I have the pieces installed, but I haven't installed the new SD card. So let me show you how I do that. It's very simple. I remove the board. In this case, the constraints on the fan power are the biggest limitation. I'm going to pull out the SD card that I had been using. This is my fresh SD card. I install it. Contacts up. And then I'm going to put it back into my case. Now I've done the same thing on these other systems. Uh, just assume that I had, I had installed the USB card on all these other systems for initial boot. I've already booted these once, so the BIOS has been flashed into Pixie boot mode, so the whole process is going to be a little bit faster. Um, you can also see I've got my network cabled. I have my keyboard cabled. I have my HDMI cabled and I have not plugged anything in. So I'm gonna plug in the network first. Here's my network power. As you can see some lights coming on there. That looks excellent. But the Pi's are still not powered up. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna power up the Pi's. Before I do that, I'm gonna move the focus of the camera out a little bit so that you can also see my monitor because that's going to be an important component for this. and we are eventually going to focus entirely on the monitor. So now when I come in, I'm going to plug in the power supply here, which means all of the pies are going to come on simultaneously. The fans, you'll hear a little bit of fan noise because I have the fans plugged in, and you're getting power lights uh, identifying all the systems. At this point, I can switch my monitor to use the second HDMI port so we can watch the system boot. So in this case, now if you would, if these were factory pies, you would actually see, and I'm gonna adjust the focus upwards here, you would actually see, uh, it would take a little bit longer for this process to start. It's, it's fast here uh, because this is the first time I've been through and I don't have to reflash the BIOS. So at this point, we're just running through a required configuration on this new card. Uh, but this might be pretty much ready. What I'm looking for is a start that says that I can now log into the system. Uh, and there are some required timeouts in this as we wait for different things to happen. Uh, the other systems with, that are Pixie booting, um, in a first pass system, they're going to have about five minutes of boot switch from 32-bit to 64, set the BIOS, reboot. Um, it's a drawn out process. And you may see what looks like a, a jumbled test pattern if you're looking at them on a monitor. It's, it is handy to have multiple HDMI monitors so you can troubleshoot what's going on. But really no supervision is needed at all. The only thing that you have to log into from a supervision perspective is the host and only that because you need to set the Wi-Fi information so that we can attach to the system. And there are some plans that uh, to continue to refine out some of these wait periods. We have the fail, now it's starting the normal process. So there's a two minute wait. Uh, you can entertain yourself by talking to yourself instead of me. Uh, unfortunately, you can fast forward the video. Here's our login. So I'm at a login prompt, hopefully you can see that. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit and get you. Oh, that's about as good as we're gonna get. We're gonna log in as root and uh, we're gonna provide a password, which is Rocket Skates, assuming I did it correctly. In this case, my, my text is slightly off screen. I logged in correctly. It's just like Digital Rebar's uh, password. So root Rocket Skates, R0CKETSKATS. Um, so at this, at this point I've, I've come in, I have a system um, that's ready to go and it's already loaded with uh, start me script. So all I have to do is say start me, provide my uh, Wi-Fi SSID my SSID and um, password for the Wi-Fi. It's going to reset the network. So it's going to tell us that it, it's getting a temporary failure in name resolution that is perfectly normal and it's gonna go through the process. Uh, sometimes this fails on the first try and I just have to do it twice. Um, it'll, we'll know pretty quickly if it starts downloading a whole bunch of um, re uh, required uh, components. It's not a lot that it has to download, but it is something.
Nope, it failed on this pass, so... I just repeated the same thing. We're gonna get the same errors down at the bottom. Oh, I see what I did wrong. First I clear. Then I'm gonna run setup and I had accidentally put in my wrong password because I added the word clear into it. And of course the Wi-Fi is not gonna connect in that case. Now we've uh, correctly resolved and the system is attaching to uh, S3 and starting to download some information. So if you're early in this process, it's January uh, 4th right now, then uh, you might have to double ping it. We'll, we'll likely reset this and, and do some updated images. This is the V1.0.0 .0 .0 of, of, uh, of these seeding images. Uh, but it's basically now completing the process. So at this point, we're um, installing Digital Rebar with the latest catalog, the latest components. All of that stuff is going through an automated install process. I'm going to get a little bit further, and then I'm going to pause, reframe the camera, and go back to using SSH um, and all these pieces. The thing that's important here is that at the end of this process, it will give me the IP address, the, uh, the Wi-Fi IP address of the system. If you were paying attention to the network architecture, the IP address of this host on the internal network is 10.3.14.1. The three client machines end up being 100, 101, and 102, depending on their boot order. Um, so but we're literally going through now and, and downloading the files that we need to do that install. I'm going to pause. I'll show you the final screen with the IP address and then, then reset up so that I can show you the next uh, configuration steps. So the script completed, took about another three or four minutes uh, after uh, I paused the video. You can see in this, there's a whole bunch of uh, digital rebar uh, setting things. This is actually building the specific DHCP res uh, reservation for all the systems. And then at the end down here, it actually gives us the IP address that was assigned by my Wi-Fi, in this case 1.87. When I go to this URL, which I'm about to do and show you the rest of the setup, I will be able to log into the system using uh, uh, my pa the password root and rocket skates uh, and then finish the digital rebar setup. The digital rebar is actively running on this system um, and they're probably pixie booting. You can, uh, you can see down here, I have a whole bunch of network activity, which means the system probably started uh, pixie booting from that perspective. If they didn't, I'm gonna, uh, replug them in. Now, once again, my system's already in a BIOS flash mode. For you, the way my first process went with this is that first I had to, the, the server actually came up faster, was able to complete that process before the BIOSes were flashed on the three Pi. So they, in, the, in a normal setup, you're still going to be seeing, you're still going to be waiting for them uh, in the steps that I show you. But I'm going to reconfigure the camera so you can watch my screen again. So we're back. Uh, with our focus back on the main machine that we have going on. Uh, remember, we do have our network diagram here, so we've been working all on this one server, which was assigned IP address 192.168.1.87. And so from that perspective, we wanna come over here and go to SSH root at 192.168.1.87. So you can see I've used uh, a host against this, so I just need to remove my key here. Not uncommon, if you repeat this process multiple times, you're likely to have exactly the same thing happen. So now I can log in uh, with that address, yes accept the key, root, whoops, rocket skates, S-K-A-T-S, -S. did it correctly, I don't think I did, yes I did, good. So now I have uh, my system here, and what I'm going to do is I want to put my, I want to do a couple of things that are normal, first I want to do an SSH key gen. That's excellent. And I want to add my key into the uh, 
I want to add my my public key into that machine so I can do a no um, a no login SSH, which will be handy when I start playing with uh, Kubernetes a bit, because I want to use this machine as a gateway. And then over here, uh, now that I've generated the key, first I'm going to add my system, my uh, key to the authorized key, so I don't have to log in. Excellent. That's great. So there is my key. And now what I want to do is I want to see the key that I generated, the public one, uh, ID. So I want to take this key and I'm going to make that available for all of the other machines in uh, the system uh, so that I can then pass through login when I, when I get to that point. We'll come back to that in a minute if that's a little confusing. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, normally I'd start here. Let's do this. There's a, whoops, not that. Uh, 192, 168, 187. You can see I've done this before. I'll log in here. It's going to object because of my self-signed key, which is perfectly normal. I have to accept that key. So over here now, what I've done is I've logged in. When I log into that IP, that IP address, it redirects me to the RackN portal. Um, one thing to stress, there is nothing that RackN installed on your systems that is now linking back to the RackN servers. The web page that we're in is serving as an intermediate point. It's a React app. It's downloaded and running on your browser and then connecting directly to the uh, digital rerar pi endpoint that we just set up. So there is no VPN, there's no secret network traffic going back and forth. You are talking directly to the endpoint using uh, digital rebar's uh, Rackens API. Uh, I'm going to do use a local API in this case uh, because there's a feature that we have just added that is not in the public API yet, but I want to show. Um, so I'm using a local version. Uh, and in this case, I want to be able to add a key. So we have a feature coming to help you add a key. I can just paste in this new SSH key. And when I do that, it will propagate the public key onto all of the other pies, uh, which is very, very handy. You'll notice the way I did that. This is, it's, we've had this feature all along. We're just trying to make it a little easier to use. In the global profile, which is the profile that's available to all systems, this is where you would set your key. So I could do this manually just by coming in and doing a normal profile edit. I'm trying to reduce the burden that you, you have, of things you have to learn, and that's that's one of the first things that you should want to have on all of your systems. So if this has gone correctly, then we would have our uh, systems up. If you noticed my funny numbering, I actually know the MAC addresses of these systems, um, and so I've already booted them. In this case, I have uh, 7F. F, um, being dyslexic, F7, 40, uh, B3 is here, so one of these machines did not come up correctly, and I'm going to uh, actually repower, because I want to show you what this is, I'm just going to delete these, which is pretty normal, and then I can't see it because it's off camera, but I'm literally pulling the power on those other three systems, and I'm going to let them get rediscovered, you can hear that my fans got quieter. Uh, so it, this is just an order of operations uh, problem for you to consider. Normally, uh, when you're going through this process, the server is going to get built first uh, because I was rebuilding the server, but I'd already flashed the three pies. They were not as they, they came up faster. Uh, so I'm just resetting to make sure everything's good, and we'll see what see what's going on. Once again, I don't need the SD cards. I could remove them. Uh, from this case and we're just waiting for those pies to, to go. Once they're ready, they will go ahead and reset. I'm going to tour you around a little bit while we do. Um, in this, the, one of the things that that startup script builds is the Edge Lab uh, subnet. And in this case, there is some special information. This code 43 is required for Raspberry Pis. Um, we set the DNS server to use Google um, and some other broadcast information. So there is a lot of magic um, that required for the pies is not magic, but specialized configuration um, that's been programmed into the system that allows digital rebar to handle the pixie boot of the 
of these systems. Also, the the version of Sledgehammer, which was loaded here, is a, is an ARM version for RPI. So there's actually a RPI specific version of Sledgehammer that's available as part of our boot process. The nice thing is is that it's just a version of Sledgehammer. So the same process could work on any system: ARM, AMD, RPI, Cloud. Um, we've been able to make it work also for our pies, but this isn't a specialized our pie build of anything. So everything we're showing you is standard off the truck, uh, digital rebar pieces and parts, and it is portable to any infrastructure that you want to run. Uh, so that's something important to show you here. Let's see if our machines have checked in. They have. So in this case, it was just a timing issue. When I rebooted all the machines, I got all three of those machines. And since they ran through our discover, our workflow here uh, for discovery includes a process to add SSH keys. That's why I added my SSH keys. If I come back over to here, so now that I have set that up, now I should be able to SSH to the other machines here. So root at 10. Uh, 3.14.100 should be easy enough for you to remember on the pies. And now, so I didn't have to do anything because my public key was propagated. That's why those steps are important in this process. So now I'm actually logged into um, Pi 100 over here, and that would uh, allow me to take advantage of uh, any of the systems that were going. Wow. All right. So we're probably about 20 minutes into this process, um, but we're not done yet because I want to do our K3S install uh, video. In this case, um, anything in the racking catalog is going to be available uh, from that perspective. Uh, you'll see that we're actually, this is for, this is actually the new coming version. So we're, we're just released 4.2 and you can, you can try different things from this. Not everything, very few of these things have been tested on our Pi. So be aware before you go crazy trying things in the catalog. Uh, our Pi is a specialized environment and um, we don't test all of the library against our Pi. Um, however, what I want what I do want to do is come in and um, actually load K3S. So by the time you're watching this video, it is likely that Edge Lab content will be built. Um, it's not currently being built as part of our normal build process. So I have to upload and install it myself. Not a big deal. Uh, I have cloned the provision content uh, pieces right here. So that is what you're seeing. So I've just gotten that out. I'm going to make this window a little bigger so you can see what I'm doing. So in provision content, I'm going to make sure I have the latest. Great. And uh, let me see, I think I am on a branch specific to Edge Lab. Good. So that is where I've been doing this work. And now I want to go to the Edge Lab uh, directory. So in this case, I'm going to show you over here. Let's just GitHub provision content. I will jump over uh, to my Edge Lab branch. This is this is the eco, the open ecosystem associated with digital rebar. So this is all Apache 2 stuff. We would love to have people participating in various parts of it. Uh, crib, our Kubernetes, real Kubernetes uh, deploy has quite a bit of activity in it. But Edge Lab over here has parameter stages, templates, workflows. And we have a thing called color demo that teaches you how to build these. Uh, I'm going to go through that process right now. and show you what that, that looks like. So from that perspective, what I need to do here is uh, do a DRP CLI, which I've already installed, bun uh, contents, bundle, and I just want to bundle Edge Lab. So what this does is it takes all of those infrastructures, code components, parameters, stages, workflows, templates, everything involved and it turns those into a single YAML file. So if I list out, there is Edge, Yam Edge Lab YAML. And what I want to do is upload that. To upload it, I do need to tell Digital Rebar what endpoint to use, which is this one. So I'm going to set, I could do this in the command line. I prefer to export it, the endpoint. So that will tell Digital Rebar. So if I do DRP CLI machines list 
and I'm going to make it pretty uh, through JQ. This will show me the three machines that I have. You'll notice this is the MAC address. If you've been seeing me talk about the MAC address numbers, that's what the MAC address is. So now that I've got I'm attached to the correct digital rebar, all I have to do is DRPCLI, contents, upload, edge lab. And that, to show me the JSON output, if I move out of the way over here and I refresh here, you'll see this is edge lab. So I've, I've literally added this content into uh, the system. And we're going to keep adding uh, edge lab specific things and bootstrapping support, some other applications uh, and capabilities into the edge lab. Uh, space here and now we get we get to have some fun so in order for me to install kubernetes with this one of the things that this edge lab added is a k3s install I've selected my three machines and I can start the kubernetes install so that workflow contains the things that are needed to install k3s it has the we have the URL set which is overridable we have the version that you want also overridable um, and it's literally going through and live installing. It's building a cluster, identifying those three machines as belonging to a cluster. Uh, let me let me pick the one. One of these machines is elected leader. It's this one. I know by the anchor. Um, and it is now going through and checking uh, the system, downloading K3S for the appropriate architecture. There's a small wait while K3S is, comes online. Um, stores the token and the admin config file and it's finished that's excellent and once when it finishes it releases the other so we've just installed k3s on this system and even uh handier we have now saved that binary here so now if i was to reset the cluster i don't have to re-download the binary that that time has actually been uh, emitted from the system so the process will go even faster if you're wondering how fast it is i can actually check my k3s install stage i get a little bit of statistics and the entire process is 41 seconds and three uh, these two wait they're actually only doing three seconds of work uh, in that whole process so now i've got the systems going um, in the documentation for the edge lab over here documentation it's going to tell us how um, we want to go ahead and access the system so I'm going to show you here what we're going to do um, I'm going to download the kube ADM to uh, ADM conf so I'm going to I just copy that over here so in this case what I've done is I've just downloaded that that cluster gotten the kube ADM conf file we're going to look at that so this was built for this cluster. Um, in this case, it's using the internal addresses. 100 got elected, which is great. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a trick and set this to 120. Whoops, got to actually edit correctly. My VI foo is weak on video. Insert 127.0.0.1. So what I've done is I'm setting it to myself, and you're like, all right, you didn't install Kubernetes here, you installed it in the cluster. That is true, um, but what I can do is I can set up an SSH tunnel just like this um, so that I can tunnel through. So if I go in here and say SSH, let me do this in a new window, SSH root, a bigger window, SSH root, at 192.168.1.78, uh, oh, sorry, 87. That's good, that'll get me there. And then I need to do my port mapping, which is L6443. Uh, six, four, four, three, to 192.168.1, uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. 10.3.14.100. Uh, 6443. So what this is going to do is take my local 6443 port and forward it into the Kubernetes master host uh, remotely. And that should be all I need to do. It's going to log in. There we go. That's excellent. So the fun thing now is because I've done that, now I can do a kubectl conf uh, let's see, I always forget the uh, exact. Here it is. I'm just going to paste it. 
Coop config. Hmm, that looks like I made a mistake. Because it should be much faster than that. Which means this machine is the uh, this machine is the master. Let's review what we did. One nine two one. So that's me. This is my own machine. Six four four three. That's excellent. And oh well, there you go. Connection refused. Uh, let's see. Go back here. Oh, you caught this, I'm sure, and I was just being clueless because I'm typing really fast on video. Woo! So now I'm logged in, everything looks happy. Come back over here, and boom! Now I am literally controlling the Raspberry Pi K3S cluster through my laptop, SSH bridged over into this secure environment. Um, every one of those nodes has internet access, so I can build, do whatever I need, I can play, and when I'm ready to reset them, let me show you what that looks like, I can literally just come say, you know what, I'm done with this cluster, I'm going to delete these systems, that's great. All the data that I stored was stored into this cluster one profile. Now you can control what you want to call that, you can build multiple profiles, there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, this is the... the uh, training wheels version of uh, digital rebar, but it's handy. And now all I have to do is unplug and reset the environment. Okay, they just turned them off. When I plug them back in and they get rediscovered, the uh, machines do not have any configuration left. I've got a completely blank slate from that perspective. Uh, now I left the host up. I did not reset the host. That way I can keep going back through this process. Public keys are going to get it reestablished. All the bits and pieces are going to get get done, um, and you can go back through and, and build Kubernetes over and over and over again, just like we do here at Racket. Uh, please, we would love for you to get involved. Buy the hardware. You can do the same. You can do the same environment. I actually test on Linode servers. Um, all the time and there's a Terraform script in Edge Lab for building a Linode environment that has digital rebar and just go and so you could actually build this in any cloud environment on any hardware and be testing it um, on your own in a matter of uh, minutes frankly you don't have to wait until you buy, buy the Raspberry Pis in this case so the Raspberry Pis rebooted it took that time that's excellent and uh, just for grins let's do another Kubernetes cluster setup <laughs> and we're going to be done in just seconds. So this is the power of repeating automated infrastructure. You can see I got an error here um, that I'll have to troubleshoot. Um, it is literally that fast to go through a complete provisioning automation cycle. Um, play with it, fix it, extend it, make it, make it yours. Check this out, uh, digital rebar slash edge lab. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, getting your feedback. Thank you.